This is not something you're used to, but this is not something I could just give you one day or just like, here, take this little piece of it and learn it really well, and we'll go on to the next one. They all interconnect. So I knew it would take a few days, but eventually it becomes, hey, that's not so bad. In fact, I think that's pretty easy now. Uh, and it's kind of cool to look at a periodic table and, and, and understand the connections that we're making here. Yes, we're talking about amino acids. Yes, we know amino acids are coded for by our DNA that's on the chromosomes that give us the proteins that are in a three-dimensional shape that drive the reactions to give us our alleles. Absolutely, that's true. But in the big, in the smaller pictures of things, why do they bond the way they do in the structures you see? And yesterday we're looking at the amino acids and, and, and figuring how many hy uh, hydrogens. Um, just understand, organic chemistry, they love to draw backbones, okay? They love to draw, okay, here's a, a backbone, okay? But this is a, a carbon backbone, okay? And I'll draw something like that, and I'll just leave it like that. I'm like, oh, what the heck is that? Well, there's a carbon, there's a carbon, there's a carbon, there's a carbon, there's a carbon. And they might go CH2OH. And one, two, three, four, five, six, we've just got glucose, okay? And they may leave it like that, but really, we know this carbon has what? Well, I really can't leave it that way. There's an OH here, okay? But they love to draw the backbones. In fact, um, just sometimes I'll draw something like this and say, what the heck is that? That's a shirt of Charlie Brown. No, it's actually a hydrocarbon chain. Okay, and you have to understand that carbon makes four bonds. So this one would have two H's here. This one has two H's, two H's, two H's, two H's. The ending will have three, right? Because carbon must make four. Every one of these are hydrogens, okay? So it's just a, a matter of getting used to, all right? And we'll do more of that, but I hope you understand what that means. Yeah? Is carbon the only uh, atom that is organic and can bond to four other elements? Uh, the answer to that would be... Yes, okay, but in truth, there is silicon who is underneath carbon, so it has the same valence electrons. Oh, but isn't that one in that like, weird line? Yeah, but it's, 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 it's a metalloid, so it doesn't quite do the same thing. And because it's farther away, the bonds aren't stronger, something we'll talk about in a later date. So the answer is, yeah, what, what makes an organic molecule organic is the carbon backbone. Like, because of the four bonds, you can make these long, long chains. Things can come off it, like our groups, okay, in amino acids, okay, but it's, that's, that's the chain by which living things make long and big me uh, molecules. Think about it, look how big we are. We have things interconnecting. What is it? It's our carbons. Think of our skin interconnecting all over the place. It's our carbons. Long chain polymers, okay? It's about the carbons. Okay, so I want to talk about the attractive forces. We spent some time yesterday talking, going back and forth. Obviously, we know we should know how an, a peptide bond is created. As I said before, we would have a C terminus of an amino acid, and we'd have an N terminus of an amino acid. We know that there's the alpha carbon, there's the OH group here, this has an R group, and this has an H, and the same thing here. Can't put anything here, this alpha carbon has an R group, the type of R group, defines the amino acid. I think we've been through that. And of course, we have the N here. And as we said yesterday, okay, what's gonna happen is when these guys collide with the right ratio, water is going to come out. That means one O, one H, and another H. And that's what happens. Now, if you notice, this carbon by water leaving now has, what, three bonds. This H has two. So the remaining bond connects here, and that's your peptide bond. But it's a covalent bond nonetheless. They're sharing electrons. That'd be a pair of electrons. And I'm exaggerating the distance, okay? And when you are naming the alpha or the, I'm sorry, you're naming the primary chain, depending upon what this R group is, you'll have a three-letter name of this small little peptide. Um, peptide or just proteins. Proteins are polymers, repeating chains. Okay, so we talked about this as something called a dehydration synthesis. Happens a lot in organic synthesis. We're putting this together. 
And of course, we can break the bond if this water comes back. Now, for the water to come back to break the bond, we'd have to pull an H off and give it to this N, and this OH group would go back here. You'd have to split water. Fancy word for splitting water is hydrolysis. So hydrolysis is breaking the bond, dehydration synthesis is what makes the bond, okay? Water comes off or water goes bond, to, so you put the water back, you break the bond. And that should be, you should be um, understand. Also the word for dehydration synthesis is condensation. You'll hear that condensation, you know, is the phase change between a gas going to a liquid if you had a uh, a Pepsi or a Coke out in a can, it's cold on a hot summer day, you'll see water develop on the outside of the can. Obviously it's the cold, it's the air that hits the cold can, and of course the air is, has water in it, that water condenses as it gives its energy to the cold can. So condensation just means water is, or, is coming out, so that's the same thing. All right, now, this is great in terms of understanding how this makes a long chain, okay, but the really the details and how proteins works is the shape they make. They don't stay elongated. Anyone remember what they call this when you have amino acid linked up in this way? What do you call this type of structure? It rhymes with primary, exactly. Primary, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's rhyming or just repeating the same word. <laughs> I, you guys overthought it like, <laughs> When I said exactly, isn't it the same word? I don't know, but uh, I'll have to ask a, a poet. All right, I don't know. In any case, uh, or a good rapper. But in any case, it's a primary chain. Okay, so primary chain, you should know, is that the amino acids are just what? Okay, are just uh, linking together. And we can make a primary chain, okay, as long as I have a list of amino acids, no one's going to ever do this. Um, but if I have, um, hmm. If I put this as an H, okay, hey, this would be glycine. So this would be G Y L. And if I change this out of group, if we're from New England, it's out of group, okay. And we make this uh, CH3. Hey, that's going to become alanine, which is ala. So that is the small primary change of ala bonded to glycine, and that'd be a very tiny peptide, and they usually exist hundreds and hundreds of amino acids long. Hemoglobin, which is the protein in our red blood cell that helps hold the oxygen, is about 800 amino acids long. So the primary chain is how it's made initially, but it's not really a functioning protein until it gets its three dimensions. So as it becomes a longer chain and it folds up to itself to make the three dimensionality, that's where it gets its function. And that's where we need to talk about attractive forces. These are all bonds. And we all know that they're pairs of electrons fighting for electrons and they're using each other's electrons to get a stable filled shell, okay? Um, and it's important we understand that. And we got these repeating N, H, C, it's the same ones over and over again, okay? And that's, these are your organic molecules. So let's take a step back and look at the attractive forces. Now I talked about H bonding. I've talked about um, these Van der Waals or nonpolar forces, but I haven't gotten into detail. So I just wanna spend a little time going over these details of two different types, and then we'll go into the other two that happen. So obviously these are bonds between atoms. Okay, that is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if I take a primary chain, okay, and this primary chain would be these links, right? So if I have every amino acid is linked together, this little beads right here would represent every one of these amino acids in this primary chain. Now this primary chain is bending on itself, 
And what we're going to say is that, hey, the R groups are what attracts. So these attractive forces, I draw lines. These are not bonds. Bonds get a straight line, which we, now, which we all know are pairs of electrons. Okay? But these amino acids can attract each other. Okay? And that's what gives these amino acids, and I, of course, it's oversimplified, their shape of how they fold onto each other. Okay? And this primary shape is starting to get into what we call a tertiary shape, where the R groups are starting to attract each other. Secondary is a little different, and I'll let you guys look at that for homework as you've been talking about that. But how do the R groups attract each other? Okay? And so the two, ma ba two basic ways are, well, if they're polar, okay, we know the R groups are polar is when they have a electron-rich atom pulling electrons close to it. N, O, or F, okay, will create a negativity. And if they're nonpolar, hey, we know they're carbons and hydrogens, okay? We know carbons and hydrogens share electrons evenly. So if you have anything with carbons and hydrogen, I say hydrocarbon, we know the whole structure doesn't have a more negative rich side or not. So what we have is we have hydrophilic, which is our polar R groups. We learned last week that like dissolves like. If I'm polar, if I've got a negative side and I have a positive side, I'm going to easily attract the negative and positive side of another R group. Now, this is not ionic. This is the partial negative. This is called electron rich area. Okay? And then I'm hydrophobic. And philic means loving. Phobic is afraid. <coughs> Water loving. Hey, like dissolves like. The bottom water layer here is dissolving the what? Food coloring that's water soluble. Okay? Even though this is starting to fail on me, this is the fat layer with a food coloring that's fat soluble. Okay? Although that's got a little color, so it's starting to, starting to corrode on me. Okay? So hydrophobic is nonpolar. These are your major way that things attract each other. Now, if you're hydrophobic, a hydrophilic, I'm sorry, the, the way that you attract each other is H-bonds. Now, I hate the word H-bonds, but that's what they call it. It's not a bond. It's an attractive force with an electron deficient H. You have to have an electron deficient H. I'm going to show you that in detail. And if you're hydrophobic, Okay, we call these LDFs. That's what we call in chemistry, the whole world. Sometimes you'll hear van der Waals. Not a big fan of that, but you hear it. Or they use the word hydrophobic or nonpolar attractions. They're all the same thing. Okay, I want to explain these in detail. Now we have two others you should be aware of. There's ionic. Now, if you're polar, you have a negative side and a, part, uh, uh, and a positive side based upon uh, uh, how electrons are unequally distributed. If you're ionic, you are a negative and positive. The whole thing's negative because you've gained or lost an electron. Okay? And, it, and it's also the what? The cysteine bridges, the disulfide bridge, where that's actually a covalent bond between the sulfurs. Okay? And we'll look at that at some other time. All right. So... I want to play this in thermoelectric attractions, and I want to explain for you how something that is nonpolar sticks to something nonpolar. That's not intuitive. It's intuitive if, if, if water, as I've drawn before, I think it's very intuitive to have water we know is polar. If I draw water, it's got an electron-rich area. That's the oxygen. Then it's got the electron-deficient area for the hydrogens. That's your positive. Okay. If you're an ion, okay, the whole thing is positive. There's no part that's negative, okay? So if you're an ion, you're positive or negative. How do you become positive? You lost electrons. 
or how do you become negative? You gain electrons. So positives and negatives attracting, that's the ionic attractions. That's because you have actually positive and negatives. When you're polar, you have an unequal distribution of electrons. And so when you draw water, how does water stick together? Well, it's polar. Its positive side attracts the negative side of another polar molecule. That's how light dissolves light. You can see a polar molecule has positive and negative areas. When you're an ion, you're only positive or you're only negative. That's the big difference. And these are pretty darn strong. Okay? All right, so let's talk about these H bonds. Well, let's talk about what's, so I think it's pretty intuitive to talk about ionic attractions or these H bonding, which are for hydrophilic. I don't, what I don't think is very intuitive is how does things that are nonpolar, that don't have a charge, how do they stick together? Why do they prefer each other? Here it is, okay? This is a nonpolar, okay, uh, food coloring. And it doesn't like to mix the water, although it's trying to, okay? It's staying with the oil, the fat, the lipid, who is nonpolar. Why? Because it's made of just hydrocarbons. Why is it sticking to each other, okay? What makes something nonpolar that doesn't have a negative side or a positive side stick to something that doesn't have a negative or positive? That doesn't seem possible. So I need to explain that to you. Now, in chemistry, you call these London dispersion forces. That's what they really are. But they're van der Waals of nonpolar or hydrophobic attractions. People in biology give them a thousand different names. Why? I don't know. Okay, so let's talk about it. All right, um, let's make this bigger. And this is, okay, don't worry about that. Don't worry about all of that. Okay, let's talk about London dispersion forces. These are the actual forces of attraction. Attraction between nonpolar groups of R groups of proteins, okay? Now, as I said before, it's not intuitive to understand how something that doesn't have a negative or positive side creates an attractive force. Well, it kind of does have a negative and positive side because if you're a nonpolar, okay, think with me for a second. You have this electron cloud. Electrons exist outside the atom. We know the nucleus is positive. We've got this cloud. If you look at this cloud of electrons, it's equally distributed. So no one side of this molecule or this atom has more electrons than another. So it's nonpolar. Now, the key here though is when these guys come together, when two nonpolar molecules come together, their electron cloud distorts. It shifts. And you'll say, well, why? Well, as these come together, this positive happens to attract this cloud. So as these come together, okay, this positive nucleus attracts this cloud and distorts the cloud. And now you've got more electrons on this side and you've got a partial negative. And you've got what? These electrons are repelled by these electrons, so they shift. So what nonpolar molecules have to attract, they have these momentary, when I say momentary, they shift. Now this is an animation to, to make it more sense, but or just a picture, they shift slightly. And the reason they can only shift slightly is because these things are made of nonmetals who are small, they're holding electrons tight, so they're not free to move, okay? So they shift slightly, but that slight shifting of the cloud, okay, creates these temporary polar molecules, weak, because they only shift slightly. Here's a negative side, here's a positive side, and they attract. Now, once they move away, they do that again. So they have to be close, okay? And this shifting is slight, so these attractive forces are the weakest. When you think of things that have fats in them, okay, if you like a nice steak, the grizzle on a steak, right? I, I know I do. Hey, that melts at low temperature. Anyone who's ever cooked steak knows that you can melt away the fat. Anyone who's cooked um, bacon, okay, knows that you can melt, most of bacon is fat. So if you keep cooking bacon, it's gonna shrivel up. What melts away is the fat. Why is the fat melt away? 
because the fat sticks together by weak attractive forces. A little bit of heat and it pulls away. Okay? All right. So, so it's really LDFs, these London dispersion forces, these nonpolar attractions are nothing more than electron cloud distorting in a way that creates that attractive force. Here's a, uh, I took this from Bozeman Science. I took some screenshots, okay? Um, he, talks, he does a nice job, um, but I, wanna, I took the screenshots to show you how this works. So here is an example of how helium, hey, two protons, it's got two neutrons, and you say, well, helium is an atom that's stable, true, it's not gonna bond, but helium could be attracted to each other to make helium liquid. It's extremely cold. Okay, leucophyte helium is very, very cold, and they use it to, uh, uh, to increase the magnetism of uh, magnets, especially in MRI. So when you get an MRI using a strong magnet, okay, they can make the magnet uh, uh, increase its ability by making it very cold. In any case, uh, so how does helium that is completely stable and symmetrical of its elect electrons, how does it stick together and become a liquid? Well, they have to get close. So what happens to the cloud when they click close? There's distortion. In this case, what just happened? This nucleus attracted these electrons. So they what? Shifted. These electrons got repelled. I'll go back. Okay. So we start again. When they come close, they have to come close. The one on the left, three electrons get repelled by the other. And when these electrons are repelled, okay, this creates more positive over here that attracts these even more. And now we've got a positive and a negative, and they're going to attract a little bit. They're never going to be strong, guys, because it's just a temporary slight shifting of the cloud. Even though I may show a tremendous shifting, and there you go. And there's the attractive force. But what happens when they move away? They're weak again. It's a temporary dipole. Okay, so dipoles to show strength of the charges. Don't worry about that. Now we know something that's pretty darn interesting talking about biology. There's a whole line of science that looks at animals and tries to figure out how the animals do it to give us uh, advantages in real life. Yes? Isn't it like morphology? Yeah, and I, I, yeah there's a whole a place of science where they try to figure out how, the, how does an ant who can carry nine times its, you know, I think 90, 90 times its own weight or something like that. You know, what kind of advantages does it do to do that? But this gecko, besides saving you more than 15%, okay, it can climb the sides of things because see this webbing here? They're made of these non-polar type of um, um, slippery kind of things, but they create attractive forces with other non-polar places. So they stick together by LDFs, okay? So this webbing here creates London dispersion forces with its uh, surroundings, okay? Kind of cool. All right. Now, what do we know about LDFs? Is that, well, if the atom gets bigger or has more electrons, there's more what? Shifting. So you think about it, kind of cool. When you look at Fluorine, chlorine, bromide, and iodine. These are the elements in row 17. They call halogens. You don't have to know that. But F2, Cl2, Br2, they're nonpolar. Two Cls bonding together is the same atom. They have nonpolar bonds, right? So these guys are nonpolar. They're the same atom bonded to each other. But look at their boiling points. Boiling point is the energy it takes to take a liquid and separate it from itself to become a gas. You gotta pull them away. These are attractive forces, okay? Well, who has the highest boiling point? Iodine. Why? Because if you go down the column, how many rows of electrons? What's happening as the atoms go down? They get bigger because there is more layers or shells of electrons, right? So iodine has more electrons than the rest of these. So when these guys get close, having more electrons, they do what? Have a bigger they, cloud. they have a bigger cloud that can shift more and create a greater negative and greater positive. And that's why they, ha they take more energy to separate. Attractive forces separate phases. These are not bonds. They're not bonds. 
Okay, you're not breaking any bonds when you break ice or melt ice. You're just pulling the water away from each other. So this is what um, uh, LDFs do. And this is how something that's a hydrocarbon can, when it comes in close contact. The key here, though, is as the molecules get bigger and there's more electrons in a bigger electron cloud, these can become significantly stronger. Okay? And give you a case in point. Okay, to give you an idea how strong they can get, but still recognize that they're weak. If you can follow my drift here, okay? Um, this, these are hydrocarbons. This is methane, CH4. You can see carbon has four bonds. It's a gas. This is ethane. Propane is three of them. There's a gas. Butane is in lighters. It's also a gas. I'm just adding more H's. So what I'm doing here is I'm adding a carbon and three H's. Okay? And what I'm so showing you is that the first one, two, three, four, four carbons, okay, are gases. Here it is. This is what I'm trying to show you. CH4. Boiling point is 161. C2H6, that's two carbons, single bond. Oh, ethane, negative 89. What's happening to the boiling point? Get higher. Yes, because they're attracting each other more. The molecules are attracting. These are nonpolar because they're hydrocarbons. So check it out. As you keep adding a carbon and, and two H's, these guys are gases because the temperature is lower than room temperature. Once you get to pentane, we're talking about liquids. These are gasolines. That they're what? Completely nonpolar. And if I go to, now decane is C10. So decane is C10, H22. Okay? If I go to the next one, it'd be C11, H22. Double it. Plus two, 22, 24, correct. Then why is asphalt, because it has more carbon and uh, more hydrogen, why is it having less of a boiling point? And that's where I'm going. Okay. As we keep adding carbons, okay, um, it's a good question. It's melting point. Oh, it's a melting point, not a boiling point. Oh. Not a boiling point. Oh. Okay, yeah, it's a good point. So from solid yeah, so these are, these are boiling points, okay? What I'm saying to you is that C35, if I keep adding a carbon, asphalt, which is the same thing, just a longer chain, is a solid, not a gas, okay? And it's a solid at room temperature because its melting point is above room temperature. So asphalt that we put on our roads is the same stuff. How come it's a solid? Because being a longer chain with more electrons and a bigger cloud, it can shift more and create larger disparity in positives and negatives that stick together. So the point I want to make is, well, it's still a weak attraction. Don't forget, they can be significant enough to become liquids and solids, but they're still weak forces. How do I know? Have you ever? Who has an asphalt driveway? Anybody at home has an asphalt driveway? Okay? On a hot summer day, ever park your bike with the kickstand in the asphalt driveway? What happens? On a hot summer day, you put your kickstand to your bike. I know it's not cool to ride a bike, guys are gonna wreck our cars soon, but when you were riding bikes around. Anyone know? It it does what? It gets mushy if you on a hot summer day in your asphalt and you put your kickstand of your bike and you set it, it's gonna stick into your what? Pavement. Into your pavement and make a hole. I have a big driveway and so people would pull into my driveway instead of just backing out, they'll do a three point turn. So when you back up and you turn your wheel and you're not going anywhere, it pushes the pavement up and creates divots. Asphalt on a hot summer day is sticky and soft. Why? Because London dispersion forces are weak. They're strong enough to be a solid, but they're never going to be such strong as bonds or rocks. 
They're attractive forces that are weak. They can become significant, but they're weak, okay? So that explains how in our group, that's CH3. This CH3 is a hydrocarbon. It's a non-polar R group. It can attract to another hydrocarbon via the what? The electron clouds moving. All right. Now, the attractions get stronger if you what? Have two big R groups that are what? Non-polar. But nonetheless, this has an electron cloud, and it can be distorted by another electron cloud that's nonpolar. Okay, good stuff right um, there. Is it possible for a nonpolar to distort another nonpolar, but then a polar to connect to that nonpolar? Yes, absolutely correct. If you look careful at this, I don't know if you can see it here, we call that an emulsion layer. Okay, there's a layer where the water does interconnect inter inter uh, with it. Think about it. If I'm a polar water molecule, it's a really good point, okay? If I'm a polar water molecule, negative end and a positive end, all right? And here you've got a fat, which is, we know what, a hydrocarbons, right? Okay, so it's basically carbons and hydrogens. Big electron cloud, who cares? This negative could distort and make these electrons move away from it, right? So this cloud could move away. And therefore, the, the nuclei here could attract this more, okay? And that could cause these electrons to repel another flippid, so it could cause a chain reaction. But even though the water can interact, the, the, the thing is this, water hooks up with itself stronger, more strongly than it does with this. So the reason why water and fats don't mix very well. They do mix, but the reason why they separate is water prefers itself. It H bonds more strongly with itself. Therefore, it's going to prefer itself. Okay, it's, it's going to interact at the layer a little bit, sure, but not as strong as itself. Okay, any case, great point there. All right, moving forward. Let's go to H bonding. Okay, all good stuff we'll learn in due time. Okay, here's an example of cyclohexane. This is a uh, compound I was trying to wipe off my sweat the other day, okay? C6H, this should be 12, right? this should be over there, 12. And this is C6H6. Who's got more electrons? They're the same shape, who's got more electrons? Doesn't each H bring an electron? Yeah, so this has got six more electrons in the cloud, so this will stick together by LDFs or nonpolars a little more than this one. So you can guess that it's um, boiling point, they're both liquids, all right, is a little bit higher, okay? And listen, it explains also why the fats of plants are liquids. Ooh, such a good connection, all right? Think about this, and we're gonna learn this in more detail, but I love the interconnection, watch, look. Anyone know what kind of fats exist in animals? Anyone? Oh. Solid. Saturated. saturated. Here's a fat that's saturated. It's called a lipid. Belbon O, OH, you get that acid ending. It's a fatty acid. The rest of these are, are H's. I'm not going to draw the rest. This is extremely nonpolar. Yes, there's a polar ending here. But this tail here, which can go on for 30 or 40 carbons, is extremely nonpolar. This is a saturated fat. Yes, what's up? Yes, exactly correct. They do use it in soap. Soap is made of, of we'll talk about that later in the year, but you're right. They use it for soap because this end here is what will attract the oils of our skin. Okay, but this will still interact. Very good point right there. Okay, fat animals have saturated fats. Okay, plants, oils from plants, canola oil. Okay, what other? Uh, corn oil, olive oil. They're not solids. These guys 
our grizzle on steak, you can see they melt at low temperatures. Butter, butter is made of saturated fats. It's a solid. Here is what a plant fat looks like. It's still got the fatty acid ending, but watch the difference. So cool. Watch the difference. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. What do you, what's different about this one? The double bonds. The double bonds. Because it's double bonded, we say it's polyunsaturated. Saturated means it's holding the maximum amount of H as possible because animals have single bonded fats. And because they have single bonded fats, they have to have the maximum amount of H's. But and plants, for reasons we'll explain later in the course, they have these double bonds here. And if carbon must make four bonds, there's less H's. And if there's less H's, there's less electrons. If there's less electrons, its cloud of electrons is smaller. Its van der Waals or its LDFs or its nonpolar or hydrophobic attractions are weaker. If they're weaker, they must stay as what? A liquid. These guys have more what? Electrons. So their cloud can distort more, which means what? They'll attract each other more. That's why these guys are solids or semi-solids. Plants, oils, and fats are not solids because they have these double bonds here, which means they can't have as many H's. Really, really cool stuff, okay? When you get to the details, I really get excited, sorry. Because you're not memorizing, you're, you're figuring this out. Okay, now, let's go to H bonding. Let's have some fun with H bonding. This is important. H bonding is where you have a polar molecule. Now this little thing right here represents a partial charge. If you've got a complete positive or negative, it's an ion. Partial just means that, hey, there's a more electrons that are pulling down here, okay? What creates the positive on the H is in a very electronegative atom. And I'm gonna keep saying this, it creates an electron deficient proton, okay? So H bonding, although you'll hear the word, you have to be a polar molecule. The reason why it's polar is because you're dealing with one of these elements who loves to attract electron density. Okay, so if I give you at things that are polar, you know that they're going to stick together because of this attractive force that we call H bonding. So if I have HF, now we don't, this is not a very friendly chemical, but you can get the idea. Hey, between the H and the F, what do we know? Lewis dot structure. F has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. H has one. But fluorine is so much stronger for electrons, it's yanking that pair away. So if you were to draw a picture, well, hydrogen only has what? One proton. So if you pull its electron over here, what do you got? You've got this thing with all the electrons, partial negative side, and you're leaving an exposed proton. That's your partial positive side. I say partial, because if I write plus one, that would be for the entire thing, that's an ion. Hey, sodium is a positive ion. Chlorine can be a negative ion. There's no other part to that, okay? So you've gotta have the three most electronegative atoms to create H bonding, okay? So, uh, I'm, going I'm going backwards to go forward, sorry. So let's go this way. So here's H bonding, okay? You can see that the H of one HF is attracted dotted line, dotted line, dotted line, dotted line. These are not bonds. But notice something. Wherever I have H bonding, I have an H attracted to an O, N, or F. H to an O, N, or F to create that scenario, okay? Every one of these has an electron deficient H. Here's water. Water sticks together. These are the partial negative of the oxygen, 
partial positive of the hydrogen. And there's your H bonding, dotted lines, the attractive force, ice. Pretty hard stuff, it melts at zero degrees Celsius. Strong attractive force, but okay, we know ice melts, and we're not breaking bonds, we're breaking that attractive force. Okay, what else we got? Yeah, keep going. Cross link polymers. Hey, anyone know what this is? Close. DNA. DNA. We're going to learn that deoxy ribo the nucleic acid actually sticks together. Okay, sticks together by H bonds. That's what keeps your hereditary information intact is H bonds. Not bonds, attractive forces. You break those H bonds, you break the double helix. Yes? That why uh, in I think it was either seventh or eighth grade we ha we said like T's always went to A's oh, yeah, yeah, that and was G's that always went to C's. Right, I say yeah. apple always to a tree, a car goes in um, a car goes in a garage. But the same idea. These are nitrogenous bases on the inside, but it's their electron deficient H's that we're going to learn that actually stick your 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 what. Um, two pairs of DNA together, okay? It's pretty important metabolic attractive force, if you would say the least. In fact, it's such a strong attractive force, Kevlar that stops bullets, stops because this oxygen negative polar attracts this electron deficient H. So H bonding can stop bullets, okay? Given the right type of uh, scenario. Okay, so any case, uh, we also have ionic attractions, okay? And I'm going to stop there today, all right? Um, I wanted to go somewhere else. But actually, real quickly, let's go to this worksheet that we had yesterday. I'm going to, I'm going to finish up with two more minutes. It's called H-bonding for organic molecules. Uh, I gave it out to my crazies yesterday. Okay, so you still have it. I just want to look at it real quick. Do you have a pencil sharpener? Yes, I do. I have an electric one. Except at home. Just kidding. No, it's right here. Right here. Yep. So let's go to the videotape. No, just kidding. Um, I gotta go here. One last little piece. Screen mirroring. We go to H2. Okay, here we go. Last little piece. Okay, so here is an example of glucose. It's not an amino acid, it's not a lipid, okay? It's a, we call it carbohydrate. We use this primarily for energy. We'll talk more about this, but it's C6, 12 H's, and six oxygens. That's the structure. You can see carbon has four bonds, but we know that Sugar dissolves in water because it's got some what? Electron deficient what? H's. This H is attached to what? This oxygen. This pair of electrons is pulled over here. This H is positive. This guy is negative. Okay, so if I have a water molecule, it's going to interact with it because the negative part of the water molecule is the oxygen. And by the way, sugar can attract itself because of H bonding, and that's how it makes solids, right? If it's in the solid phase, it's attracting itself. This negative end could attract an H of another sugar molecule, enough to stick together, okay? But you need to be able to figure out electron deficient H's. Let's see if we can practice this. Okay, is this an electron deficient H, Christmas. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Why? Bonds. Bonds. The O. It is the O, N or F, that's pulling on them so much that exposes the positive. That's an electron deficient H. Is this an electron deficient H? Yes. Yes. Is this? Yes. 
How about this one? No. This eight, this you're right. So we're doing no, we're different. That's no. That's not, like this, does not H bond. That shears them right down the middle. So this is not positive enough. Good job. Okay. Let's go on. How could two sugar molecules attract each other? Eh, we get that. Let's go to the lipid. These are the, these are the fats. What kind of attractive forces would they have for each other? The LDF. Yeah. So this would be LDF in between them, or you could say Van der Waals or nonpolar. But there might be some, what, places here that they could H bond. Couldn't this O attract this H? Okay, so there's some places here. But for the most part, and again, this is underrepresented. Most fats have tremendously longer hydrocarbon chain. So most of their attractive forces are due to, what, is this an animal fat or a plant fat? Is it saturated or unsaturated? Uh, saturated. Animal. Saturated, holding the maximum amount of H's. So therefore, bigger cloud, it's going to be a solid. Okay, our fats and our body are solids. Okay, but again, all right, cool. All right, so we're going to take a break now. For those that are home, you can go right to the homework. You'll be in tomorrow for adult period doing what these guys are doing today. Okay, or starting today. So we're taking a break. You guys can take a break and or uh, continue uh, with the homework. For those that are on...